Hey guys, Jared Wesley here of Live Traders, and it's that time of the week. It's lecture time, educational lecture time, not fluff lecture time, not entertainment time, actual valuable information time. All right, this week's topic, I know I've said something similar in the past, but I have to be quite honest with you guys. This topic is something that I absolutely unequivocally in the top two or three requests that I have gotten over the last five or 10 years. And it's a topic I have not talked about in probably about 10 years in trading. And what is it? Trader tax accounting. Um, it seems that you guys want to know more about trader tax status, trader tax accounting. And to be honest with you, I'm not gonna lie, I, I don't know why, okay? For newer traders especially, in your first year or two when you're not making that much money, tax accounting doesn't really mean that much to you. If you're not making much money, the IRS isn't gonna tax you on it because you're not making much money. So this video talks about trader tax accounting, trader status, whether you're investor status or trader status. It talks a little bit about LLCs and entities and things you can do to lower your tax burden, some write-offs that you might consider assuming you are trader tax status uh, versus investor status, short-term capital gains versus long-term capital gains. Uh, it's a lot of mumbo jumbo in the sense that I do reference the irs.gov website. Uh, I do traderstatus.com as a great website you can check out traderstatus.com i have no affiliation with them but you can check them out um, for topics on or related information on this particular topic guys it's not the most exciting topic that we can talk about but it's an important topic uh, for many of you the first year in trading it really doesn't matter but the one thing that i want to make very clear here okay and i am not a cpa so any information in here that might be a little bit wrong or off guys um, then that's that's on me, but at the same time, it's on you because I am not a CPA, I'm not an accountant, so make sure um, that you understand that you need to talk to a tax professional to get the real um, truth about what's going on. But most of this information is pretty good. I also talk about what is not, what is not, not, not a three bar play. I'm tired of getting emails of three bar plays that are just garbage and junk, and then people saying the three bar play doesn't work, Jared. No, it does work, it works very well when you take good ones. So the second half of the presentation, about 35 minutes into this, I talk about the three bar play and what are not three bar plays, average trading range, what a good three bar play looks like. So please, please pay attention to that as well. But one last quick comment before we get into it, guys, on trader tax accounting. Um, if you choose to use trader tax status, not investor status, if you qualify for it, and you do have to qualify for it, you have to elect it and go to the IRS and they will tell you if you qualify for it. Once you elect trader tax status, you cannot go back to investor status. It's a very big decision that you're making, okay? For a possible short-term gain, it's a big decision for the rest of your life. So make sure you consult your tax account, your CPA with that. Also, I'm speaking predominantly to US-based traders. I don't know anything about the European tax code, the Asian tax code, the Canadian tax code, the Mexican tax code, just the United States of America. So you guys have waited and waited and waited and waited for 10 years for me to do this video. Well, it is finally upon us. Now we get to see how many people actually watch the darn thing. Why? Because there ain't a heck of a lot of charts in it. You guys love those sexy charts, those Halle Berry charts. You guys love those things. But the good news is the back half of the presentation the last 20 minutes is all charts i tried to balance it out and make up for it so trader tax status let's get to it guys i'm jared wesley one last quick comment you can get a one dollar 14 day trial we've lowered it from 30 days to 14 days one dollar 14 day trial to the chat room guys and don't forget to hit that like button if you actually like the video and of course hammer that subscribe button as well. All right, Jared Wesley of Live Traders, let's get to it. Today's topic is the long awaited, frequently asked for, not terribly exciting, trader tax accounting. I am blown away, utterly stunned and how many requests I've gotten for this in the last five years. Um, it's up there in the top two 
topics that I've, I've had requests for. And I'm blown away just by how many people are interested in this topic because let's be frank here. Let's just start off on a really negative note and then we'll turn positive. Does it really matter to the vast majority of people out there? No. Most of you guys are struggling. You're probably break even. You're new to the trading business and you're worried about how much Uncle Sam is going to tax you on $100 in earnings, $1,000 in earnings. Okay? But I'm going to go through it anyway because it is relevant to some people. I'm not trying to be mean off that. I'm just telling you the truth. Okay? So we're going to go through this. Uh, I do, or I should say, I will be um, also talking a little bit about the three bar play uh, after this lecture. So I'm going to start off trader tax accounting for about 30 minutes, maybe a little more. Then I'm going to spend about 10 or 15 minutes on what is not a three bar play. I did a lecture on this about six months ago, but it's clearly not sinking in. It's clearly not sinking in on what is not a three bar play. All right, so I will speak a little bit about that, but the vast majority of today's topic is trader tax accounting. What is the deal? All right, so first and foremost, you expect me to say this. I am not an accountant, okay? I never have been. I'm not a trained CPA. I'm not an untrained CPA. I am nothing when it comes to accounting. I have a professional do my taxes. Certainly, you learn things through the years, and that's what I'm hoping to impart in you guys but at the end of the day, I take zero responsibility for any errors in this presentation. Consult a tax professional, okay? Consult a tax professional. I am not that person, all right? Also, this, ladies and gentlemen, is an unbelievably great resource. www.traderstatus.com. And as it says, I have no affiliation at all um, with this website, with this company um, at all. All right. This is just things I've seen over the last year or two. I've, I've used this website for questions that I, I that I've had personally, um, but I found it to be like it says a good, reliable source for information related to trader tax accounting. Traderstatus.com, and I have uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Notated, bookmarked, whatever you want to call it. Um, the areas in which I got my information from. Okay, um, cited. That's the word I was looking for. All right. So. Let's get into taxes. Uh, whether we like it or not, and remember guys, I'm speaking mostly to Americans here. I can't speak for Canadians or South Americans or Europeans or Asians or Australians or whatever. I, I don't know what your tax system is, okay? So this is mainly for folks in the United States um, because obviously that's where I live and I'm most familiar with, okay? Um, uncle Sam is, is an uncle that loves you so much that he wants the best for you so much that he wants to t stick his hand in your pocket and take a little bit of money out of it. And he is a person or a relationship that you will never get rid of. He's an uncle that never dies, okay? Even when you do, he still doesn't leave, all right? Um, so he loves you so much it hurts, okay? That's Uncle Sam, okay? So let's talk about this for a second. Matters of tax. We're going to talk about three main topics. Investor rules, trader insecurity status, and trading entities but these two are the ones that you guys are most probably most wanting to focus on traditional investor rules versus trader insecurity status and basically guys this means the government the irs has marked you as a full-time trader okay that's what this means the question then becomes is what do you need to do to be designated trader insecurity status we're going to talk about it what are general investor rules? Well, I'm not going to read all these slides because there's a lot of tech slides and we all know how bored you guys get and how your lack of attention span falls off if you don't have Halle Berry on the screen, which is a trading chart. You guys go googly goggly eyed over trading charts, but when it comes to actual information that really matters, you fall asleep. Okay, so investor rules are pretty simple, guys. This is for most people who are not traders. All right, this is for most folks that just have a long-term stock portfolio, a 401k, maybe they own a little bit of this, a little bit of that, et cetera, and so forth. You have a $3,000 capital loss rule. This is the maximum amount you're allowed to write off in terms of losses that you might incur throughout the year, all right? It limits your margin interest deductibility if you have a margin account and maybe there's interest charged in that margin account you know for example some of you guys write off the interest on your mortgage 
somewhat similar to that, okay? That's the general principle or general idea of this. Educational expenses, travel expenses, anything related to owning those stocks or your portfolio is not deductible, okay? So let's just say, for example, hypothetically, uh, I don't know, you have a 10 stock portfolio and maybe you take five, 10 trades a year on that portfolio, okay? And you happen to fly to Seattle to go see, uh, I don't know, a Brown Brothers presentation on some great new product they're pitching, all right? Or a Goldman Sachs presentation on some great new product they're pitching. You cannot write off that trip, that seminar expense or any of those things because this is just for, you're just a, a standard investor. All right, so there are things that you can't do, all right, because you're not trader in status, so to speak, okay? Wash sale rule also applies to you. I'm not gonna get super deeply detailed on this, but the wash sale basically says, guys, if you sell a stock for a loss within a 30-day period and buy it back, you cannot realize that loss on your taxes. It keeps people from abusing stock losses for tax benefits. You would frequently see this towards the end of the year in December. People might sell a stock at a loss to gain the tax benefit and then try to buy it back at a similar or better price. You cannot do that. And technically, as it says, it's actually 61 days because it's the 30 days before and the 30 days after the sale. All right, plus one day. So if you sold a stock December 1st, it would apply to November 1st all the way up to basically January 1st. But basically what this says is you cannot sell a stock specifically the, for the purpose of taking a loss on it and buy it back. You can take the loss on it if you don't buy it back and it's 30, 60 days later. But again, that's also limited to 3,000 bucks. Okay, so this is general basic investor rules, which is where I hate to tell you guys this, 99% of the people listening, not the general public, 99% of the people listening to me right now are gonna stay in this. And you're going, what do you mean, Jared? But I'm a trader. I take tons of trades. I know, and we're gonna talk about it. And we're gonna talk about why most of you are in the investor rule category. Okay, I know you all think you take a ton of trades and you might actually, but there's more to it than just taking a lot of trades, okay? All right, so trader in security status. This is basically what many of you are wanting to be in because it designates you as a quote, professional trader in the eyes of the IRS, okay? First thing you have to know, there is no definition for this. There is no, for example, if you make $27,000 a year and you take 247 trades, you are now considered a trader in securities that, no, it's a very gray definition and it's at the subject of approval or denial by the IRS. The IRS has the ultimate say in whether or not you are a trader in security status. Even if you think you are, the IRS ultimately determines this. Okay, there's no definition in the tax code that says, if you meet this, 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 and this requirement, you are in. If you don't, you are out. It's gray, okay? But the positives of being designated trader in securities, and I'll talk more about this in the next couple of slides, are you can deduct all trading-related expenses, okay? All. So if you fly to that seminar in Seattle and it costs you a couple grand to fly there, stay at a hotel, and you, I don't know, learn something from Brown Brothers or Goldman Sachs, Guess what? You can write that off. Guess what you can also write off, which we'll talk about it here in the next slide or two. You can write off your internet and home office expense, all those things. You can set up a retirement plan, a healthcare plan. You can elect mark to market status, which eliminates the $3,000 loss limitation rule. It eliminates the wash rule and it converts short term. And this is the key. It converts short term capital gains to ordinary income. This generally generally speaking, is better for you because of the write-offs, all right? Short-term capital gains, just so you guys know, for those of you that aren't aware, not long-term, short-term, which is what traders would have, short-term capital gains are always taxed at ordinary income, okay? Short-term capital gains are always taxed at ordinary income. Somebody is asking the question, do you have to apply for trader insecurities? Yes, you do. You have to elect it and tell the IRS, I would like to be a trader in security status, and they will let you know whether or not they agree with you. Most people 
get denied. I can't remember what the exact statistic was that I read on the website, but it's high. Like three quarters or more get denied. Okay. And we'll talk about some of the definitions of that. But I want to talk about the converts capital gains to ordinary income a little bit later. Okay. We'll talk about that in a couple more slides. All right. So here are some of the guidelines. I tried to make this a little bit bigger and in blue because we could get lost. If anything you do with taxes, you can get lost in the tax code. And you'll see here a couple slides later, some of the things I've copied and pasted and I cited, don't worry. All right. So you seek profit from daily market moves. Okay. That sounds simple enough. It's pretty gray. It's pretty esoteric, but you seek profit from daily market moves, substantial trading activity. Now, most of you go, well, great. So far, so good. I meet both of those requirements. This is where many of you will fail. Income. Substantial trading activity and income. Most of your income has to come from trading for the IRS to deem you trader in security status. This is where most of you will fail. You'll fall on your face. And I, even if you make 100 grand a year, if you make 500,000 at your normal job, 100 grand is not substantial enough for the IRS. But if you make $100,000 a year trading, but you make $52,000 at Circle K, one, I don't know why you'd still be working at Circle K, but you understand what I'm saying. If you made 50 grand at your day job and 100,000 trading, the IRS would look at you and go, you know what? Most of your profitability is coming from this activity, okay? However, however, if you work at Circle K and make 52 grand a year, do managers even make that at Circle K? Anyway, and then you make $13,000 a year in trading and you trade every morning because you live in California and you're at the second shift at Circle K and you trade and you make 13 grand a year. Not terrible, you make a grand a month, 1,200 a month. No, you will likely, I can't speak for the IRS, I'm telling you likely you will be denied trader and security status because most of your income is not derived from trading, okay? Also, short-term holding periods. They wanna see you in and out of positions in hours, minutes, maybe a day or two here and there. Okay, you are trading for income, not trading for supplementary, supplementary income. Okay, so in order to qualify as a Schedule C trader in securities, a taxpayer is generally required to rely on trading activity as a primary, not secondary, primary source of income and meet meticulous record keeping standards. Most of you are just like, all right, I'm done. This conversation's over. I'm logging out most of you will not qualify for this, okay? You must pursue the trading activity in a business-like manner, which means what? Record keeping, as it says, not just record keeping, but office keeping, even using your car when you drive to a, a seminar or education, you have to treat it like a business. I always tell you guys, treat it like a business. Most of you don't. Also, the amount of time you dedicate to this matters, but it matters in comparison in comparison to what other activities you're doing, and I'm not talking about golf. So for example, if you trade four hours a day, but you work two hours a day at Circle K, well, substantially, you're working more as a trader than you are at Circle K. But if you work eight hours a day at Circle K and two hours a day as a trader, you better have way more income coming from trading than Circle K because substantially your activity is Circle K and not trading. I don't know why I got caught on Circle K, but you get the point. So you guys can see these guidelines are not easy. And this is why I'm telling you the vast majority of new traders who are the ones asking this question, I find fascinating why I've put this lecture off for five years is because of this very thing. If you're not making money, what difference does it make? One, you're not making money, so you're not gonna be taxed. Two, you're not making enough money to be called substantial income. Therefore, you wouldn't be classified in this bracket anyway, okay? But before you log off, I have a bit more to talk about, okay? So, oh, <clears throat> excuse me. This is right off of traderstatus.com. I copy and pasted this in full fairness right off of traderstatus.com, and there is the link to it if you want to copy and paste that, okay? A trader purchases and sells security frequently to catch the daily market moves. A, trader prof a trader's profits are derived through direct management of purchasing and selling. What this means is, you don't have somebody managing your account. You don't have a professional who is a, a registered investment advisor managing your account, okay? 
of trader does not perform merchandising functions or any service that need to be compensated, does not have customers, okay? A trader engages in continuous volume and magnitude of purchases and sales. I'm just reading this. You guys can read it yourself if you want. The amount of time spent on trading is important to trader status, okay? So frequency, extent, and regularity of your activity matters, okay? It matters, and you can't take too much time off. So if you take six months off and go to Fiji because you made so much money in the first six months, the government might, I'm not saying they will, they might say, well, that's not continuous trading. You took six months off, okay? Well, I don't know. They might say yes because you made so much money, but they might say no. I'm leaning on they're going to say no, you took too much time off. Take a couple trades while you're in Fiji is what I'm trying to tell you, okay? And as it says here in bold, it's the primary source of income. All right, more information. Why am I doing this? To back up what I'm talking about, okay? These are all court cases that have happened, people arguing they wanna be trader in security status and the government says yes or no to them, okay? So this is what I'm talking about, backing this up with regard to actual cases. What's the taxpayer or what's the, the trader's intent? Where is most of their income coming from, okay? I'm not gonna spend much more time on this, okay? All right, more definitions. I'm not gonna spend much time on Must seek profit from daily market. Notice this is all the same stuff I've already talked about. But again, different court cases, different activities, different times people have challenged the IRS and lost. Okay, you can get it, traderstatus.com, tra or sorry, traderstatus.com, okay? Is the purpose of the activity to make a profit? Do you participate in your activity just for fun? Now, remember, Remember, you might think it's serious. The government might look at it and go, you're not that serious. You just mess around two days a week, all right? Think about what I'm saying. It has to be significantly pursued and profitability has to be substantial. Do you depend on trader income from the activity of trading? If so, you have a far better chance. If not, you don't, okay? Are you trading, meaning are you changing your methodology? Are you making meaningful adjustments to help improve your trading? That's a benefit. If not, the IRS might go, eh, right? So again, I can't speak for the IRS, guys, but I'm just trying to tell you, it's a challenge to get designated as a trader security status trader. It's a challenge, okay? An activity is presumed carried on for profit if it makes a profit in at least three of the last five tax years, including the current year, or at least two of the last seven. So they're not saying you have to make money every year. They're saying you have to make money most of the time. Okay? Most of the time. Okay? Now, let's talk about some of the benefits. I've talked about some of the negatives. Let's talk about some of the benefits of actually being designated um, trader tax status, right? You can write off a lot of things. Subscriptions and publications like the Live Traders Chat Room, Swing Trading Newsletter. Let's say you subscribe to Trade Ideas or Finviz for scanning software. That's a business expense, assuming you are designated a uh, trader in tax status, right? Internet, telephone expenses, part of your business, right? Trading system expenses, monitors, you know, your PC, your printer, um, office stuff like paper, pens, pencils, you laugh, but stuff might add up, okay? Seminars, whether you're taking professional trading strategies, taking mentorship, all of this is right, right offable, if that's even a word, okay? Travel to those seminars and courses, you can write that off. Home office rental, what does this mean? For those of you that will run a business from your home, guess what? You get to deduct a percentage of the square footage of your home, whatever you're, so if you live in a thousand square foot house and your office is a hundred square foot, you get to write off 10% of your utilities, right? 10% of your internet, 10% of water bills, gas bills, trash bills, etc. That's a home office rental fee or expense. If you have a mortgage, you can also write off percentage of your mortgage as a home office rental, okay? Fringe benefits, healthcare, all, these are all things that you can write off in a normal business, and as a trader, if you're designated a trader, you would get to write these things off as well, okay? So then the question becomes, well, what kind of business structure do you wanna set up? I am not an accountant, I think I've made that clear. Most 
people will set up a flow through entity, which is some type of partnership or an LLC or a sub S corporation. All right. Most people, you can do a C corp if you want, but most people will set up a basic LLC where there's no partners. It's just one person. Maybe they add their wife. I don't know. That's what the average trader will do. Why? Because they're not big enough to really worry about everything else. So what this basically means is everything you make as a trader flows through that LLC onto your personal tax return. Okay, so you will have a tax return for your business, right? Your LLC, let's call it, uh, I don't know, Jared Wesley Trading. All right, that's the name of the LLC. Well, that LLC, Jared Wesley Trading, all that income will pass through to my personal tax return. Okay, that's what pass through or flow through means. Most of you will be in that category. All right, most of you. So I'm not gonna talk about the rest of them. All right, so that's where most of you will do, assuming you get designated a trader. Most of you will not get designated a trader. So now the main question becomes this. What's the difference? What's the difference whether you get designated as a trader or you're designated as a regular good old fashioned investor? What's the difference? Let's take a look. So for United States citizens, and I'm focusing on married filing jointly. Now I understand they're single filers, head of how I get it. Most people are, are married filing jointly, assuming you're married, you'll fall into one of these first two categories. Okay. We're using an example of a trader making a hundred thousand dollars a year. This is right from debt.org and the next slides are from right off the government website. Okay. As well as a couple from money gym. So this is 2020. This is what you'll file next year. Next April, you'll file in, in this range. 37% is the highest tax bracket you can be in in the United States. Okay. Now, if you're in California, it hurts even more than that. But as a federal income bracket, 37% is the most that you can pay. Now, let's be honest. Nobody pays 37% for two reasons. One, it's a progressive tax bracket. And two, they have write-offs. I don't care if you made $10 billion, you might pay 36.99%, but you will not pay 37 because it's progressive, okay? So even though this bracket says 22% from 80 to 170,000, you are not actually paying 22% because half of that income is taxed at 12%, right? 80,000 of this income is taxed at 12. So let's see what that looks like. I'm focusing on somebody who makes 100 grand a year, okay? Hold on one second. Let me skip ahead. All right. No, actually, you know what? Let me stay on this slide. I apologize. Let me, before I skip ahead, I want to talk about this. Capital gains, guys, long term is irrelevant to you guys. I put this up here just so you could see most people are taxed between zero and 20%. Zero and 20%. You're going, okay, that's not terrible. You know, you're, you're not falling into this category as a trader. Read it in pink. Note, short term capital gains are subject to taxation as ordinary income at graduated tax rates. This is right off the IRS website. Short term capital gains are subject to taxation as ordinary income. Most of you will fall into this category. Okay, don't get me wrong. You might have a 401k that's taxed at long term capital gains if you hold it for more than a year, more than 18 months, etc. But for traders, traders where you're in and out, in and out, in and out every day, you will likely be taxed as ordinary income. So what will this look like to you? Let's take a look. So let's say hypothetically, you are investor status. You are not trader status because most of you will fall into this category. Let's say you made $100,000 trading last year. 100 grand, that's what you made. Your effective tax rate is 13.58%. Okay, you're going, how does that, how do you figure that, Jared? Let me show you real quick. $80,000 of your income is taxed at 12%. $20,000 of your income is taxed at 22%. So 80,000 at 12%, assuming married filing jointly, and 20,000 at 22%. If we go down to this nice, pretty little calculator, okay? Money Chimp has this, by the way, pretty cool feature, all right? So let's say you made $100,000, okay? You are technically in the 22% tax bracket. Technically, but it's a graduated tax bracket. 
So you're not actually paying $22,000. I want to be clear about this. It's a graduated tax bracket. So you're not actually taxed at 22%. What you're actually taxed at is this, okay? I Guys, I had to do this separately. I apologize. They don't have a bracket for 13.58%. So I had to just make up a state tax rate at 358 and a rate at 10%, okay? So 3.58%, 10%, you will be taxed $13,580, okay? So you will net out $86,421 out of this. Now, why is that? Because you can't write anything off. So if you made $100,000 as a trader and the IRS did not, did not designate you as a trader, you would pay 13.58% in taxes or $13,500. Now, in case you're curious what that looks like, okay, hold on, let me pull this down. Right here is what it looks like, okay? Take a quick look at this. So if you were in 2020, married filing jointly and you had $100,000 taxable income, your tax rate would be 13.58%. How did we come upon this? I already mentioned it to you. $80,250 would be taxed at 12%. See it over here? And my cursor is right there, okay? The additional $19,750 would be taxed at 22%. If you do the math and combine them, it comes out to 13.58%. The math is down here for the people that aren't very good at it, okay? So you would simply do, we could do it on our calculator, 19,750 times 0.22 is $4,345, okay? And 80,200, you have to do 10% here at 19,750. 12% from 19,750 to 80, right? You guys get the point, okay? I'm not gonna do the math for you. It comes out to 13.58%. So you would apply that to the $100,000 that you made and you'd be taxed 13,000. $580. Is that making sense to you guys? I'll go back and show you again. So you would basically net out $86,420. Okay? $86,420. Cuz you can't write anything off. Now, what if what if you were designated trader in security status? What would be the difference? Well, you get to write off business expenses now. So what would be the main difference? Well, Normally, you're going to be in a tax bracket of 13.58%, all right, before your write-offs, before your write-offs, before your expenses, okay? So normally, you'd be paying $13,500, but what if, what if you had some write-offs that equated to, say, fourteen dollars Now, guys, I tried to keep this reasonable, all right? I'm not an accountant but I've been doing this long enough and I've owned enough businesses to know if you try to write off $80,000 in expenses on a hundred thousand dollar income, you are asking for trouble from the IRS. All right. So I tried to keep this reasonable. Okay. Those are reasonable expenses. You might even have $30,000 in reasonable expenses. But if you tell me you had $80,000 in reasonable expenses on a hundred thousand dollars in income, I'd question that. All right. So here's some examples. Okay. Say you had a yearly platform fee or a brokerage fee, right? Say it's a hundred dollars a month, $1,200 a year. Say you're in a chat room. It's $150 a month. It's $1,800 a year. Say your, your internet's $150 a month. That's $1,800 a year. Your telephone, $150 a month. It's $1,800 a year. Home office expense, rent, electric, say it's two grand a year. Office supplies, $500 a year. New trading computers, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Comes out to 14 grand in expenses. Now, again, again, you might have $30,000 in expenses. You might have $5,000 in expenses. I don't know. I tried to be what I consider reasonable. So now you would have been taxed $13,580 on your 100 grand, but you didn't really make 100 grand because you get to write off these expenses. Okay, so now what does it look like? It's going to look like this. $84,500 is what your actual taxable income will be. So you'll actually end up paying $10,368 after you take out your expenses, which comes out to 12.14%. Okay, so 12.14% is of 85,000, 
okay? But you actually made 100 grand. So technically your effective tax rate's 10.3%, right? Let's be honest, your effective tax rate on $100,000 is 10.3%, right? You guys remember the whole Mitt Romney thing like six years ago, whatever it was, eight years ago, you know how he's only paying a small percentage? This is how these things work out. You give money to charity, you have expenses, blah, blah, blah. So let's take a look. You made $100,000. You wrote off $14,600. Your taxable income was $85,400. Your average tax rate was 12.14. So your tax amount is 10,000. 12% 12 of 85,000 equals 10. Your effective tax rate on 100,000 is 10%. You paid 89,000 or you made 89,000, okay? I hope that makes sense. I tried to lay it out very clearly to you guys so it would be understandable. What does it look like compared to investor status? So this is trader and security status compared to investor status, it looks like this, okay? 89,000 is your take home pay. 86,000 is your take home pay. So you save $3,210. And guys, that's not 3,000 in write offs. That's actual money you would write a check to the government for. You actually save $3,210. Now remember, if you're a newer trader, you could certainly have much more or much larger than $14,000 in expenses, right? Maybe you, you just became a trader and you had a really good first year and you bought a whole new office setup. Maybe the office cost you $6,000 to buy a desk, a computer, all that stuff, right? Maybe because you're new, you took like $10,000 in seminars. I don't know. So you may have $30,000 in expenses. You'll save even more. You'll save even more, okay? Over here, guess what? Your expenses are exactly the same. You still went to the seminar. You still had a computer. You still had office expenses, but you can't write it off. I'm gonna repeat that because this is the crux of the argument. You made the exact same amount of money doing the exact same thing. Both of you took a thousand trades. Both of you made a hundred grand. One has trader and security status, one doesn't. One gets to write off their expenses, one doesn't. One pays $3,210 more in taxes on 14 grand in expenses. But what if your expenses were 30 grand? You saved a lot more, didn't you? You can't write those off over here. The question then becomes, do you deserve to be trader in security status? I don't know is the answer to that because maybe like a smart person, hear me out, maybe like a smart person, you kept your day job for the first two years. Okay, this makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? You kept your day job that you're making 250 grand a year at and you made 100 grand as a trader your second year, or not your first, your second year, and the IRS says, no, man, you made 250 grand at your regular day job. 100 grand is not substantial enough for your income for us to consider you trader in security status. But you're not gonna wanna quit your day job because now you're only making 100 grand as a trader, but 250 at your day job. You're gonna just eat, you're gonna eat the money. You're gonna eat the money. And let's be honest, if you were making $250,000 a year in your day job, you'd be in a much higher tax bracket than 13.58%. So you'd pay even more. You'd pay even more. So you have to balance this out. Most of you, until you become profitable and it's your, I'm not gonna say your sole source of income, but one of, you're gonna have to bite the bullet and pay more in taxes. But let's be frank here. I don't mean to be negative. Most of you are not having to worry about it. I'm not being rude. Most of you are not having to worry about this. You might be making 10, 20 grand. Maybe you're not making money your first year or two, okay? So this is actually more beneficial to you, investor status. You're going, why? Why is that more beneficial? At least you get $3,000 in write-offs, right? You can claim $3,000 in losses. Over here, you can't claim the $3,000 in losses in trader and security. So imagine, imagine this, for example. 
Imagine you made $100,000 in year two, and then in year three, you're trader in security status and you made 10 grand. That's not very good, right? Or you made three grand, not very good. It's not gonna help you being trader in security status, okay? So guys, I did this on married filing jointly. If you wanna go back and do the numbers on single filer or head of household or married filing, you, you can do that. We'd be here for hours, all right? Okay, you could do that for hours. I'm telling you now, good resources, moneychimp.com, traderstatus.com, and the government, the irs.gov. All three of those websites I use to compile most of this data. Everybody's tax situation is different, okay? But most of you will not qualify for trader and security status. Most of you will not. If United States citizens is what I'm speaking to. I can't speak for the rest of the world. Okay, so I hope you guys found that helpful. Now I wanna spend about 15 minutes talking about what is not, 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 not a three bar play. I've beaten a three bar play so badly, like it's like a dead horse that gets beaten over and over and over, but you guys are not getting it. Bar one must be a wide range igniting, a wide range bar igniting a move, okay? Igniting bar means the first or second bar of a move. This is very important. Wide range bar means double the size of an average bar. This bar should have increased volume, but not required. Guys, as is the case with all trades, with all trades, we always trade into void. We never, ever trade into resistance or support. Yes, we never trade into support on the downside. We never trade into resistance on the upside. That's just a given. We don't do it, okay? So when I show you a few examples, you're gonna twist your head. Now, average trading range is a lecture I gave about six months ago. I'll put the link in the description. You guys can go watch that video again, okay? You have to look at the average range of a stock, guys. Not the gap, just how the stock trades from 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. If an average trading range for a stock is $2 and the stock is up $4, why would you buy the high of the day? Ask yourself that question. If an average trading range for a stock is $2 and it's already doubled its, its average trading range, why would you buy that stock? Especially on a breakout or a three bar play. If you buy the high of the stock, it's already exceeded its ATR. We're asking the stock to do something unusual, something special. Your goal is to get in the stock before it exceeds its trading range, and then hopefully it will exceed its trading range and you'll make even more money. It's not that stocks can't or won't go higher than their trading range. It's, it, it happens all the time, but we're odds traders. So we're entering an area of decreased odds after it's exceeded its average trading range. Now, I put together, oh, I don't know, about five or six examples. Three or four are from the last three days. They're from this stinking week. And they're from you guys. You guys mentioned these to me, whether it was in the chat room, whether it was through email, whether it was in YouTube comments, you guys mentioned these ideas to me. If you hadn't, I wouldn't be having this little conversation with you right now. Okay. This one is from two days ago. So here we have a stock. Roku in this case, I blew this up huge so you guys can get chop, chop, lower, 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 gap down, rip. And you somebody said, hey, look at the three bar play on 15 minute Roku. Right there, this is not a three bar play for multiple reasons. There's like so many reasons it's not a three bar play, it's not even funny, okay? One, the first bar is too wide. It's a $7 bar, guys. Did I mention it's a $7 bar? That's a lot. Two, bar number two is higher than bar number one by about a dollar. Okay, wait, let's go back because I know you guys need to see it with your own eyes. Okay. Doesn't it say here under number two, must be in the upper 50% and have relatively equal highs. Relatively equal highs. Okay. Bar one, two, and three should have similar highs. This does not have a similar high, okay? This does not have a similar high. And 
What's right above it? What's right above it? Resistance. There's all kinds of things wrong with this. Wide range bar that's too big for the average trading range, okay? Two, bar number two is above bar number one. Three, it's moving right up into resistance. Guys, does anybody can... No, I'm gonna ask the chat room this. For those of you paying attention at the moment, how can we eliminate making this kind of a mistake? Does anybody know the answer to that question? How can we eliminate making this kind of mistake? You guys are paying attention. I love you guys. Luke says checklist. Blue Star says checklist. Daniel says checklist. In fact, everybody's saying checklist. Isn't that amazing? You actually have a checklist. Isn't it also amazing that when you deal with things in life that are really serious, you have a checklist or a protocol to follow? Do you notice that, guys? At a bank, they have protocols to follow, right? When you talk, When you're talking about security or talking about money or talking about risking lives, there's a protocol to follow. Why don't you do this with your trades? Why? You don't treat it like a business, which is why the IRS doesn't think much of your so-called business because you don't treat it like one because you do boneheaded stuff like this. Use a checklist. If you can't get through the checklist in time, then you can't take the trade. Pilots and checklists. Pilots have checklists. Bankers have checklists. Police officers have checklists. They all, well, sometimes you wonder. But anyway, you get the point, right? We all have checklists when it comes to things that are really important, okay? By the way, I'm a huge supporter of our law enforcement. I didn't mean to take a dig at them in a negative fashion. I mean that sincerely. It's not a joke. They get a bad rap most of the time, okay? Anyway, here we go again. Oh, look. This happened a couple days ago also. Gap down, bullies to the tune of about $3.50, which is well above this stock's average trading. Let's take a look at the last five days here. So the low of the day on McDonald's was like 216.20 and the high was 218.20. That's a $2 range. The next day was like 217.80. The low of the day was like 216.50. Dollar thirty range, about the same, about to, oh my gosh, a $4 range, $3.50 range on this day though. So every other day is doing anywhere from 2 to $3 in range, but this day it does three fifty, dollars and you want to take it. Can we say average trading range? Can we say checklist? The bar is too big. Bar number two is a relatively equal high in the upper 50%. Good. You're also coming into some overhead supply, right? Right here. See the bottom of that pivot? That's overhead supply. So you're into resistance and bar number one is way too big. How can we eliminate doing this? Checklist, okay? Checklist. Next, this is getting good, isn't it? Here we go again. This one was yesterday. Yay, gap up, stock pulls in. So average trading range is okay here. Bar number two is okay here. Where the heck are we at? At support. Now, some of you are going, Juice Jared, you look like a real fool, don't you? Because this stock worked. That trader was right. Guys, let's go back. We are odds traders. We base our decisions in real time, not in hindsight, off of statistical probability. Have I made myself clear? You don't know what the future brings. And if you did, you certainly wouldn't be here listening to me. Okay? This is a bad trade. You're sitting right at support on $50, double top support. I don't care that it went lower. The market was down 900 points yesterday. Great. Rising tide lifts all boats. It does the same. So this worked. It's still a bad trade. Did I repeat uh, one more time? Because somebody's going to ask this tomorrow about the same type of pattern. This is still a bad trade, even though it worked because you're trading it, shorting it right into support. Bad trade, okay? Here's another one. Somebody asked me a couple weeks ago. Now, again, how can we eliminate? How can we eliminate this? Checklist, let's go back to our checklist, okay? Just to refresh ourselves. I'm a bit sarcastic, aren't I? All the time. Okay, the main considerations of a three bar play Bar number one must be a wide range bar igniting a move. Bar number, or this igniting means the first or second bar of the move. And it says right next to it, this is very important. 
So it wasn't like this is a passing comment. It says this is very important. Okay. Okay. I think we get it. First or second bar, very important. We also talked about average trading range, didn't we? Talked a bit about average trading range. Okay. Let's go back. Let's go back. All right. Bar one to, oh, I don't even get past the first criteria. I don't even get past the first stinking criteria. What are you guys doing mentioning this crap? And look at it. You would have lost your shirt on it. Just one R actually. For one bar, two bars, three bars. It's exceeded its average trading range. And it's the third bar up. Guys, what are we doing? Ask yourself, what are we doing? And look, if you guys want to watch YouTube to be entertained, I feel like Gladiator, are you not entertained? Right? I seriously, I feel like that's what trading is sometimes. Because all the YouTube channels that have all the most popular people watching them are the entertainment channels. Are you guys looking for entertainment? Are you looking to make money through trading in the stock market? Ask me or answer me that question. All right? The five most popular YouTube channels that have to do with trading are all entertainers driving around in their fancy cars. All right? Is that what you really want? To be entertained or do you want to make money? Ask yourself. If you want to be entertained, this isn't the channel for you. This isn't the place for you. This isn't the chat room for you. It's not that place. Okay? It's not just that one, Jose. There's a lot of them. There's tons of them. Some guys live in Arizona. Some girls live in Canada. You know, some people live in Vermont. It depends where they're at. Okay? There are very few people that are truly focused on what's important in trading. Okay? Most of them are just trying to grab a headline to grow their YouTube channel. All right? I'm happy they're making money. It's the American way. I'm happy for them. But if you want to be entertained, this isn't your place. Third bar up, you're not even going to ask about it. It says first or second bar of a move. You can't even get past the first checklist. And it failed. Okay? All right. This one is an example of a good three bar play. Okay, a good three bar play, and it just didn't work. Why did I throw this in? I threw it in as a hitch, because you're, you're thinking, what's wrong with this one, Jared? There's nothing wrong with it. It went about $4. The average trading range is about $6 on the stock, so it's, it's below its average trading range. Wide bar, narrow bar, in the upper 50%, relatively equal high. It peekabooed over and stopped out. Okay, they don't all work. They don't all work. Okay, that's why we have stop losses. Now, this next one is a source of pride for me because I'm going through all the things that you guys are doing wrong. Okay, I'm going through all the things that you guys are doing wrong. But let's talk about the positive side. Wide range bar, narrow range bar, blast off, stop out. Oh, you're going, Jared, I thought you said you're going to be positive. I thought you said you're going to be positive. I am. Let me show you. I got an email from somebody. I took out their name. I hope it's not in the, the, the text here. And it says, Jared, I took the five minute chart on BBBY, February 18th. First three bars are a classic three bar play. Igniting bar, resting bar, exactly the same high, exactly a 50% retracement. Poof. Wow. Great. And he goes, I hope I'm right. He is right. Now you know it's a he. Anyway, okay. <laughs> That is a textbook three bar play. Textbook. But what have I also talked about? The 84% rule. Okay. Stock promptly rolled over and stop executed. Lesson three the three bar play failed. That's why we use stop losses. It's true. But the 84% rule is lesson four. I have a video on this. The 84% rule did it not that long ago. I love getting emails like this. And no, I didn't email myself, guys. I didn't, okay? This person actually watched a video, came into the chat room and learned and applied what they learned. So the application is twofold. One, they took a great three bar play, nothing wrong with it, and it didn't work. They got back in on the 84% rule and got paid. And then, better yet, they wrote me an email thanking me for it. It's wonderful. 
I need more of these kind of emails. Email me, guys, if you've done something and listened to what I've said and it's worked out for you. This is fantastic. So after all, I don't know why I have tax consideration basics up there. But anyway, so after all the yelling I did at you guys, there is one person out there in the ether, in the universe, that actually has paid attention. All right? And listened. And they ultimately profited. They lost on the first trade, profited on the second. They made one R net net. Fantastic. That's what I want to see. Okay? Now, back to, is this a three-bar play we should take? This was a question somebody asked me. Uh, granted, this was like four months ago, but look at the first bar. It's put in a full day's move, $4 move. So we don't even get past checklist one. Average trading range is gone. It's putting a little three, four bar play slash wedge, but look where it's at on the daily. It's extended into support. Extended into support. We don't short stocks at support. We don't short stocks after they've moved past their average trading range. The day before this stock did $1.50, it's already done $4 in five minutes. How much more do you think it's gonna go after running $4 in five minutes? Answer, not much. Oh wait, it's also at support. Good trade? No, this is the world's worst trade. Extended into support equals a bounce. This has all kinds of things wrong with it, okay? Here's another example. Here's a stock that's up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days on the daily. Now, why am I bringing these up? The reason I'm bringing these up to you guys, and we're gonna close this out here in the next two, three, four minutes, okay? Is because most of you out there are reading this page and you're ignoring everything else. You're ignoring the average trading range. You're ignoring support or resistance. You're ignoring the gap. You're ignoring so many things. You think you've watched this one video and now you know everything in the world about the three bar play. No, there's a reason that professional trading strategies is 525 pages. There's a reason for that because there's actually more to know about trading than one slide, okay? And we prove that when we start looking at stocks like this. This is a novice gap. Yes, it did go a little higher, but you're not buying the high of the day on a novice gap. Okay, wide range bar, narrow range bar, blast off, nope, why? This bar is too big, it's $6, and it's a novice gap, okay? You see that? It's a bad, bad trade, guys. Now, this is a bad trade I took. This, at, see it there? This was a bad three bar play. Making mistakes is okay. But continually making, I can't spell or type, making the same mistake is not okay. And you guys are making the same mistakes too frequently, right? I actually called this 365.35 at 360.20. Guess what? I got smart and got out early. I broke my plan to get out. I probably shouldn't have broke my plan, but it saved me five or 600 bucks. I only lost $20 on this trade. This is a bad trade. Why? This bar is too big. It's an $8 bar. It's breaking support, or sorry, resistance. That's fine. It's just too big of a bar. It's just too big, okay? You can make mistakes, guys. Just learn from them, okay? Here's one more, okay? Before I show you a couple of good ones when we wrap this up. It's a stock, second bar of the move, wide range bar is acceptable, narrow range bar is relatively expect, acceptable, equal lows, right at support. Support, more support. Don't take it. Always look to the left. One trade working here or there does not make statistical relevance. We are odds traders. Base your trades off of it, okay? Now, a couple ones that worked. I've shown this one before. Here's IQ, three bar play. All right, wide bar, narrow bar, rip, and then the last one, and then we'll call it a day, okay? Here's one on Netflix, guys. Notice it's not extended. It's only a $2 move. Wide range bar followed by a narrow range bar, rip, okay? So there it is, 345 by 343.25, boom, okay? So I hope that you guys took some information out of this Taxes are a boring topic, but you should know at least a little bit about it. 
I had somebody tell me the other day their accountant wants to charge them. This is a true story. Their accountant wants to charge them $10 per trade they take on their tax return. And I just laughed. I said, your accountant has no idea what they're talking about. Go to somebody else. Because just that comment means what? They don't really know how to prepare a trader's tax return. Right? My last year's uh, trade station account was 337 pages. You think they're going to charge me $10 for every trade? That's insane. Okay, so a couple quick comments before I let you go. Traderstatus.com is a great resource. You think I'm pitching them because I'm selling, I'm not. I have no, I don't even know who runs the website. I have no affiliation with them. I'm just trying to help you guys. Check it out. Traderstatus.com. You can always go to irs.gov. Uh, you can also go to MoneyChimp if you want some of these cool little, uh, uh, not this one, sorry. If you want some of these cool little tax accounting helpful tools. All right, just remember at the end of the day, guys, most of your income has to come from trading and you have to trade substantially, not just in income, but in activity to be considered a trader. The difference between investor status and trader in securities can be a big deal. But, and this is the biggest but of all, I can't remember the guy who sung that song. I like big butts and I cannot. This is the biggest but of all. It only matters if you make money and decent amounts of money. For you guys out there making zero to 50 grand, zero to 20 grand, it doesn't really matter. Investor tax status versus trader and securities is not gonna be that, maybe it's a thousand dollar difference. It's not gonna be that big of a difference, okay? It's not gonna be that big of a difference. But if you start making real money, then it becomes a problem to be investor status versus trader and securities. Then it becomes a bit of a problem, okay? All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you learned what a three bar play is for real this time. Okay. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit about taxes and that will do it for this week's presentation. I'll see you guys again next week. To get more great educational content, subscribe to the Live Traders YouTube channel. This way you'll get email alerts every time I upload a new video.